Hi, and welcome to Mondays with Marlo. We're really excited. We've got back our very first guest, Dr. Oz, has come back to be with us again today. He's our very favorite guest, I have to say. I'm so excited. Yes, yes you are. I get to be in Marlo's house <laughs> next to her. Yes, right in my house. All, all of her pictures. That's really cool. <laughs> What's well, great, though, so many people wrote in, and I couldn't use all of the questions, but so many people wrote in to say that you've given them faith in doctors again, that they mm, really had you. lost faith. They love you. They love your show. They love your graphics. They love your tips. And I'm one of them because, as you know, I watch you every day on my treadmill. Well, so God bless you. Thank I'm you. healthy now because of you. <laughs> Those graphics really, really help. So today I want to get right to these questions because we only have a half an hour. And the, one of the first questions is, and it's kind of a major theme in all the questions that have been mm. coming in, which is, do you have five tips for the summer for women to really live healthy? So, so let's go over, first of all, obviously some differences between summer and winter and the like. The good news about the summer is you're always psyched up because you've got more sunlight, which turns out a lot of those hormones in your body that you want to have there. So one of the key hormones is from vitamin D, mm. which is actually a hormone in your body, and you get it from the sun. But the sun just doesn't just give you vitamin D, it gives you all kinds of other nutrients inside of your body that you can't capture in pills or medications or anything else, so you gotta get sun exposure. Now, I know what you're saying. You said, mm. I don't get wrinkles, I don't want melanomas. Melanomas really are not linked to sun exposure, they're linked to sun burns. Oh. Uh, and you will get wrinkled if you expose your face in the back of your hands. So put sunblock there always, but expose your torso, your legs to sun for about 10 to 15 minutes a day. Take advantage of the summer, get those nutrients from vitamin D. That's number one. Oh, number, I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah. Number two, get you, yes, it good at that? It's liberated yeah, me. Exactly. <laughs> Number two tip is I want you to get outside and I want you to walk. It is what keeps humans alive more than anything else. Avoid the frailty of being uh, sedentary in your home. It's the summertime. Go outside and find excuses half an hour every day. You don't have to exercise. Just go out and walk and play and be yourself. Number three, I want you to be cautious about the foods you buy. You can now buy local, buy the green, colorful foods that come out of the ground looking the way they look when you buy them. They're readily available in the summer and they're inexpensive. And when you cook those foods, this is tip number four, do not burn them on the charcoal. When you burn foods, you create these things called AGEs, Advanced Glycosylation Endpoints. Forget that word. It's, the acronym is AGE because it ages you. You don't want to burn any of your food. So when you go out and barbecue, make sure you always marinate the food for about 10 minutes at a time. You mean even meat? Like, like Especially meat. Really? When you put meat that's not been marinated on a charcoal, and you cook it and get that little that flavory taste from a little bit of a burn, right. it's actually, those are carcinogenic. Oh. So you don't want those. You want to get a little bit um, of, uh, of a marinade on it so it smooths out the cooking process. So you cook it th you know, fully through, but you don't get the burr on the surface. Oh, good. And the fifth tip, and this is important, this is why I love you so much, <laughs> you got to give a reason for your heart to keep beating. So in this summertime, find the loves that you have in your life. Go out and pursue them, especially with the people. Uh, go out and do things together and connect. That's how you keep your heart pumping. Those, those are the five tips. Those are great tips. Thank you. And we're going to do every one of them. Oh, here's another one from Tracy about the summer. She says, now that the summer months are here, is my sunscreen still okay to use from last summer or from two years ago? Does the SPF still have the same potency? Well, your sunblock usually does not last all that long. It uh -huh. does tend to expire. There's two kinds of sunblocks. There are mechanical sunblocks, right. zinc oxide, for example, which is that you know you look like Casper the Ghost if you put on SPF 50, but you do want to have some protection, so you can use a lower power. And the newer mechanical sunblocks uh, are quite potent. They don't make it look like Casper the Ghost uh, by blanching you, and, and you can put them on smoothly. They tend to last for quite a long time. The chemical sunscreens are ones that have chemicals in them that react with your skin, and so they take about 10 to 15 minutes to be activated once you put them on your body. And, and although they do work very effectively, I prefer the mechanical ones, less allergies with the mechanical ones, and they work as soon as you put them on your body. Once it's, you're off more than a, a year, or especially two, I think you should toss it and get more. But the, you know what the bigger tip is? If your sunblock's still around a year later, you're not using enough of it. That's you're, right. You're going to put a big dollop in your hand. Most people use a quarter of a sunblock that they should. You, so right. automatically, I'm telling you right now, America, double the amount of sunblock you put on your body. I can guarantee you, you will not go wrong that way. And what about the number? They have 60, 70, then I read somewhere where well, once it's 30, that's enough. Is that true? You have read correctly. Yeah, listen, frankly, 15 is probably enough for really? most people, yes. And especially if you're darker skinned, African Americans, you don't ever need more than 15. But I say 30 because it costs the same as 15. Even if you don't put as much on, you still get a lot of the benefit. You don't ever need more than 30. Once you get above 30, you know, you're never going to be on the sun that long. Remember, 30 means you're going to be out there 30 times longer than if you didn't have it on. Well, that's the whole day, so you're not going to do that. Right. Oh, isn't it? Crazy. Okay, this is from Mary. She has teenagers. I'm concerned about my teenagers drinking so much Coke and Pepsi. I'd like to hear more about the dangers of popular drinks like Pepsi, Coke. Are there chemicals in them? Thank you. I guess she wants to tell her teenagers. She does. Well, I just wrote a book on this topic. Oh, good. Which is doing quite well called You, the Owner's Manual for Teens. Yeah, now, listen, I've, you know, I've got it right here. Oh, look I've at got that. It right here. There yes, it is. Yes, yes. I'm going to get you to sign it for me. See, I put quarter on the outside for teens. I try to con them into thinking it was for them. 
Oh, wow. But it's for the parents, too. I got news for you. Because both parents, like us and teens, my daughter Zoe, one of my daughters, helped me write the book. Oh, great. Uh, and here's the story. Uh, we've written a lot of owner's manual books. I've written them for mostly adults. Talked about aging and weight loss. We talked about uh, all the different things that can help you live better and uh, more beautifully, etc. But we've talked about adult topics. Talked about menopause. We talked about prostate problems. You know, teens don't want that stuff. They want to know about themselves. Right. But they were reading our books. Oh, great. They were textbooks, literally in schools. They were th th our book. They were carrying around. So we decided, you know what? We're going to write a book that's just for teens. So we've tried to tackle some of the biggest obstacles that teens have, but we wanted to write it in a cool, edgy, fun way they'd resonate to. Right. We want their parents to like it also because the parents will get the information and now you can finally answer your kids' questions. For example, Mary, they're asking about soft drinks and whether they're good for your kids or not. Listen, I can tell you what we do in our house. We don't ever bring these foods in the home uh, because I don't want the battle to be fought at home. I'd rather fight the battle in the supermarket. So if you don't want it in your house, don't bring it in your house. Mm -hmm. There's no health benefit to soft drinks. Listen, I can get for a celebration if you want to give your kids a, a soft drink. They're f perfectly fine in that quantity. But to make it a staple that every day you're having a couple soft drinks is empty calories, plus you're poisoning the hormone system of the body so that it can't respond as readily to the food that you're eating. And when I say poison, I'm not saying you're poisoning you. I'm just messing, you're messing up yourself so it's harder for you to do the right things when you see food in front of you. So if you want to eat the right amount of calories every day, don't take them in liquid form. Instead, water ought to be the foundation. What we do in the summertime is a great idea that my wife came up with. All the good ideas are hers, you know that well. <laughs> as, for, as for you and Phil. Uh, what, what we do is we take a big vat of water and we cut up citrus fruit or, or whatever we actually want. Cucumbers, doesn't frankly matter. Whatever little bit of taste you want in the water. Sometimes kids get bored by plain water taste. Yeah. So you put this big vat of water on the counter. It's glass so you can see it through it. It looks very attractive. Cut the, fr the fruit in there. Throw it in the beginning of the day. The food, the water will begin to taste like that fruit. So if you want you know, put peaches in there, you have a little bit of a peach taste to right, the water. That's great. The kids will grab it out of there. It looks cool. It's fun for them to get. It's different every single day so they don't get bored by it. Right. And I can get rid of all the soft drinks. That's a great tip. I'm just wondering, I hate to put you on the spot, but since we've got the teen book here and there's mm -hmm. so many parents who write in, are there any other little tips you want to tell us for teens that parents should know? So we divided the book into several major categories. One of them was cosmetic, because uh -huh. teens always have questions about body order, they right. have questions about why they've got dandruff, they have questions about acne. So I wanted to actually give them information, both to the teens and to the parents, so they could be on the same page on these very common, sometimes embarrassing questions. Take acne, for example. They said, I don't really want you popping pimples because you cause a lot of maceration or damage of healthy tissue around the pimple. But if you're going to pop it, two rules of thumb. Never pop pimples that are in this nose area. This triangle from the top, brow of the nose down to the side of your lips, this triangle, that's called the triangle of death. <laughs> oh, God. Okay. You remember that. I think we'll get that. <laughs> because those pimples drain back into the brain. You don't want to fool with those. But if you have pimples elsewhere, you can pop them. We give you illustrations in, in the book of how to do it. Take a needle. Do it with your parents so you do, do it safely. Sterilize the needle with either alcohol or, or hot water and then go horizontal to the skin like this. Don't jab it like you're playing you know, uh, you know, a, a, a psycho movie. <coughs> you know, just tip, 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 you take, you take a tip of the pimple and pop it with the needle. Let the pus drain out and you can very gently extrude whatever material is in there. It'll heal faster so you can still go on that date on Saturday night uh, and not be embarrassed by a pimple on your forehead. That's great. Is there, any, is there anything in the drugstore that you recommend for pimples? They actually, you can, you know, obviously they, they sell all the, the material you need there as well. The, the Accutane works. It's a very powerful product and usually put under prescription. Most of those benzoyl peroxide products do work. Uh, they tend to be drying to the skin. Uh -huh. So you, you'd rather do a multifaceted approach. You want to eat the right kinds of foods. Listen, in Papua New Guinea, they have no acne. Now, neither of us are going there anytime soon. But the, I bring it up because the food that they eat there does not stimulate acne in their face. What so. do they eat? They eat very wholesome foods, foods that come out of the ground looking mm -hmm. the way they look when yeah. they eat them. So there's yeah. no chemicals in there's no right. processing, there's no simple sugars, there's no saturated fats in those foods. Right. It's not the only reason. In right. fact, it's very hard to prove a connection between food and acne. But I do think in my heart there is a connection because it changes the fats in your face that are coming out. But at the same time, I want you also to recognize that you can buy products in the stores, but the simplest thing you can do is to make sure you maintain a, a clear uh, facial hygiene and th even things like ret like Retin-A uh -huh. or, or vitamin A products act as exfoliants. They can be very beneficial to kids. Yeah. One of the big point about teens, and we talk about this a lot in You the Owner's Manual for Teens, is we talk a lot about the emotional issues that kids go through. Because you know what, the number one risky th thing that kids do is bad decisions.
Yeah. Number one reason kids die is accidents. And kids make mistakes when they're in high school especially that will scar them for the rest of their lives. And that's because I remember being a teen, as I'm sure you do. You, you so want to make decisions on your own. Yeah. You, so not, you don't want to have to keep saying, Daddy, can I do this? Or Mommy, should I do yeah. this? So that's when you make the bad decisions. You have, you, everything supports that. Right. You know, yeah. kids, they, actually the pheromones of the parents uh, repel the kids. Kids right. want to be away from their parents. Right. They, be, they turn the bats, their sleep cycles turn upside down, which right. is supposed to happen because they're supposed to go out and theoretically a thousand years ago they find their mates right. at midnight so they wouldn't be sleeping all day long uh, to catch <laughs> they up. They still try to do they that. They still try to do that. <laughs> These are all very natural but we spend a lot of time trying to help kids figure out how to study more effectively, how to deal with the emotional problems, how to deal with bullying. All these become important issues that reflect on the kind of health right, you have long term. Right. Okay, we're going to move along. Thank you. This is from Judith. I've lost over 20 pounds and I feel better than ever, but I can't seem to lose any weight in my midsection. My arms and legs are strong and muscular. Even my ab muscles are strong because I can do exercises that I wasn't able to do when I first started working out. So do you have any suggestions for how I lose the weight in my midsection? So I don't know how old Judith is. I'm going to guess. She's over uh, 40. She's over 40. <laughs> And what, what, here's what happens. When you hit age 40, the ovaries stop making as much testosterone as they used to make. Remember, the ovaries make estrogen, right? right? So when they stop working, you get menopause, but they also stop making testosterone. And without testosterone, you don't have the key hormone that the body needs to make muscle. So you start to lose a little bit of muscle mass. So the same amount of food that Judith was able to eat five years ago without any problems, now because she doesn't have that metabolic furnace of muscle treating through those calories, becomes too much. Plus the muscles get lax. So you begin to put on that belly fat, that little yeah. bulge that they have down there. So there are things you can do. Uh, for some women, if you've had children, it does make sense to consider having plastic surgical reconstructive work done because mm -hmm. you can pull the muscle together. And I only bring that up, I know it can be expensive and that is big time surgery. That is not small time cosmetic surgery. So you do it while you're having the child, you mean? No, no, once during? you've had the child, once you've done all your children, if you have a pooch, you can't get rid of it and you're staying in as good shape as you can. That's the one time that, that tummy tuck surgery might make sense. But before you even get close to that, the real issue is make sure you're doing your belly workouts correctly. A lot of women just do crunches, they go back and forth. Look at your belly as you do the exercises. If your belly muscles are bulging while you're doing the exercises, then they're gonna get bulgy when you stand up tall too. Also hold your breath in there? Yes, pull your belly button towards your spine as you do the sit-ups and, and you put your hand on top of your belly. You can feel your muscles right. tense. If you tense the transversalis, the crossing muscles, then you're gonna pull the belly back. If you only compress the rectus muscles, the up and down washboard muscles, you'll get a big belly. It'll bulge out. You don't want that. That's great. That's good advice. This is from Sherry. She says, I have breast cancer and I've read literature suggesting I should take vitamin D. Is this correct? Sherry, without any question, if you have cancer or if you want to avoid cancer, I would take vitamin D. Probably the single most important thing that I would do to reduce the infections you get all year long is also to take vitamin D. Why? Because vitamin D is a hormone, and it is a hormone, will stimulate your immune system. And your immune system will therefore be more able to pick up early cancer cells. Remember, everyone watching me right now has cancer. We both have cancer right. cells. Right. But they're just individual cells that hopefully our immune system recognizes and can take out. So you want to get vitamin D in there to stimulate the immune system to work normally. Vitamin D deficiency doesn't just cause problems with the bone. It causes not only autoimmune issues, because your immune system is not functioning normally, right. but it makes you more prone to infections and it weakens your body's ability to cope with cancer. Those are some of the many reasons that vitamin D is critical what to you. What do you recommend? How, how much? I'm well, taking 2,000 a day. Most people benefit from either 1,000 or 2,000 a day. Mm -hmm. And listen, I will tell everybody right now, especially if you're darker skinned, that you probably need to be on a supplement, especially if you live in the northern climates of America. And by north, I mean north of Atlanta because in the winter months you don't get enough sun. Now in the summertime you do have the ability to get sun, so go out and get it. But in the meantime, if you're not getting sun exposure, and there are plenty of people in Florida, Texas, and Southern California who are not, uh, then I want you to go out and get you at least 1,000 units a day, but you gotta check your levels. If your levels are low, you have to bump it up to 2,000 more. There are some people who need 5,000 units of vitamin D every day in order to get adequate levels in their blood. And now, can you take too much? It is very difficult to take too much vitamin D. Probably 10,000 a day chronically might put you over the edge. Right. But, but you With know what? Two or 3,000? Not even close. Not even not a problem. And you know, if you go out to the sun for 10, 15 minutes, yeah. you'll get 10,000 units. Oh, really? Yeah, so you get a lot from the sun. Uh, you get a lot more than just vitamin D from the sun, which is why I recommend that as your primary course. Uh -huh. But 1,000 or 2,000 is a very safe dose. That's great. Um, this is from Jenna. Whenever I have sex two days in a row... How lucky she is. I know. <laughs> Ready to go, Jenna. Congratulations, Jenna. Uh, we did ask uh, people, I mean, pending people wrote in and said, may we ask about sex. So I hope yes, this yes, is okay. Of Whenever I have sex two days in a row, my vagina hurts so much on the second day that I can barely go through with it. Why is this? Is there anything I can, any way I can fix it? I swear we're not doing anything too crazy. So again, Jenna, her age is an important factor here, mm -hmm. but not all women uh, who are postmenopausal have this problem. It's also very common for younger women. There are several million women who have vulvodynia, which is a condition where you actually have pain 
in the, in the uh, uh, vaginal area, probably related to, to pain fibers that are very sensitive. Either there's a low-grade infection there. Not if, I'm not talking about sexually transmitted illnesses. I'm talking about simple low-grade bacteria, and bacteria yeah. fungi, you know, vaginitis, things that you can get from many other sources. Uh, so you have to be cautious about that. Uh, and of course, lubrication, which is sort of self-evident, becomes a very important factor here because the, the, the friction uh, during intercourse can be very traumatic to those nerves. So obviously, it's what you want because it brings joy to both members of a couple. But especially after a certain age, lubrication becomes a primary primary goal. If you are over the, older than the age of 45 or 50, there are some wonderful creams that I would recommend you considering. Some, some of these, uh, these estrogen creams are hugely effective, especially in the local area, right. in both providing lubrication but also loosening up the tissues a little bit so they're more receptive so you don't have the stretching and the tearing that happens during intercourse. And, and maybe they should talk to their doctor, right? Well, you know, I tell you something. I, I, on philosophy, I try not to send you to your doctor. Everything I say, I could, I could add the comment, talk to your doctor. But oftentimes, you're not going to. I know that. A lot of folks don't have any insurance. Even yeah. if they've got jobs, they don't have insurance. Right. A lot of times, they can't afford to go to a doctor, even if they, if they do, because they don't have the time to make for yourself. I want you to do that. I wish you would. But I'm always speaking under the a belief that you will see your doctor if you can make that possible. But if not, at least take what I'm saying to heart and think about it. And you could go to the drugstore and get something over the counter, right? Many over the counter products. Everything I'm talking about today, you can act on yourself. And listen, the more you're a world expert in your body, the better you're going to be able to talk to your doctor as well. Remember the word doctor? I mean, doctor, it means teacher. So ideally what you're doing is you're going in there with some insights about why you're having vaginal pain after the second day of intercourse and you're not embarrassed about asking about it because you just heard some thoughts that Marlon and I just talked about. Go in there with a bit more informed the process and, and ask some of these questions so you get the answers you need. This is from Inga. What is a sensible amount of water that should be taken daily? I've heard eight cups, but that seems ridiculous. Inga is so smart. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is a myth. I'm going to bust it right now. People say eight cups of, of water every day is essential. This came out of a 1945 study done with USGIs where they wanted to see how many calories these young men would burn in a day. It was about 2,000. Then they said, okay, for every one calorie you burn, you've got to use a cc of water. That's 2,000 cc's. That's two liters. Well, you know, that's two, that's two quarts, which is half a gallon of water. So eight cups of water is basically that much water. So what we decided, everyone, since then, was, you know what, tell everyone to drink eight cups of water. The one thing they didn't factor in was the reality that most people get a lot of their water from the food they eat. A potato is 70% water. So here's the rule of thumb. You don't have to eat or drink eight glasses of water. What you want to do is drink enough water so you can read through your urine. If your urine is clear, you're good to go. Wow, great. So you're saying how much water should we drink a day? You don't have to drink any water as long as your urine is clear. Oh, I see. So, so for some people, it's three glasses of water. For, for some, it's nine glasses of water. If you're mm -hmm. outside working in this weather, it'd be 12 glasses of right, water. Right, right. But as long as your urine is clear, then you're hydrating adequately. That's a much better gauge. If you're drinking, uh, rather eating watermelon all day long, you probably don't need any extra water on board. Oh, wow. This is live from Candy. She says, I hope you had a wonderful birthday weekend. Thank you. What is the biggest lesson you've learned from your colonoscopy? I thought your Time Magazine article was fabulous. Well, you're and you're right. a bad patient. I am. I admit it. And that was good of you to tell us. It made us all feel better. Well, if you notice on the cover, I'm, 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 I'm touching myself. I saw I'm that. trying to examine myself. <laughs> I saw that. The doctor in me was reconciling the bad patient in me. <laughs> Thank you, Candy, for the kind wishes. You know, for my birthday, I stayed home by myself with my kids and my wife. I demanded that my daughters all play sports with me. <laughs> uh, my son, Oliver, he was, he was more than willing to play. Uh, uh, and we had a wonderful time together. Um, but I, I, I reflected a little bit back on the last year, because a year ago exactly at my birthday party, my 50th birthday party last year, I promised myself I would get a colonoscopy, and I bragged about it to all my guests. So a month or two later, I got around to doing it. I did a very bad job in my prep. I ate lentils. I, I, I read that. I couldn't believe you did yeah. that. It was actually lentils with beets. It was really good. Shame on you. It was, but my <laughs> colonoscopy doctor, Dr. LaPook, <laughs> was complaining vehemently the whole time. And it was all fun and games as he started to you know, fight his way through the lentils until he found a precancerous polyp. Right. Which uh, should have been a wake-up call. But instead, what I did was spend most of the year obfuscating, procrastinating, just finding every excuse possible to avoid getting re-imaged. So to answer her question, did you learn... What did, what did you learn? Stop procrastinating? No, I learned why people procrastinate. And the reason I wrote the Time Magazine cover piece was not about my story, because that's, you know, that's, that's interesting to a little bit of, uh, of us, but not to many of us. It was really about my trying to figure out why I was a bad patient. Why all of us? Right. Why so many of you watching at home don't do the things you should do? Because fundamentally, what I'm trying to figure out is why do rational people, and I'm assuming you're rational, why do you do irrational things? So let me ask, tell you what I think it is. I don't think it's because we think we're immortal, because I know I'm not. 
I think it's because we don't want our daily life disrupted. We don't want to be juggled around. Uh, we don't want to have interruptions in the routine we built for ourselves. So instead, we put our head under the sand and ignore right. reality. Right. And I also recognized that it wasn't about me. It's not about you. It's about the people we love. When you don't do things, smart things, like getting screened for colonoscopy at age 50, because you know it's not just diagnostic, but can cure you from the problem as it did me, then you're hiding from the reality that you're hurting the people who love you the most in life. And that's a lesson I didn't want anyone to miss. Good for you. Good yeah. for you. That's what you learned. That's a good yeah. thing. This is live from Stella. Are taking a simple multivitamin enough for a 36-year-old to maintain good health? Stella, the question is absolutely not. A multivitamin is part of the building blocks. Listen, there are four building blocks for health. You need to eat the right foods, and I wish we could all eat the foods we need to get multivitamins. Very few of us do, less than 1% do. So for the, the, mere, the mere mortals watching, you do need to take a multivitamin. So still, that's part of your plan. You need to get daily vigorous activity. We've talked about that. Uh, you, you have to have passion and vision and, and, and hope in your life. And hope is not just the right thing happening. Hope is about making sense of what's happening in your life. And the fourth pillar is to get the screening test, like the colonoscopy uh, that I had to have this year, just to make sure that you're not missing something that might step through because of your genes. Those are the four building blocks. No one of them by themselves will get you the goal. And if I had to pick just one to favor, I just one goal, it, it will be the physical activity one. Because when you look at people who live a long time, they always have daily vigorous physical activity. So vitamins are part of it, but they're not even the biggest part. I just love that. I love tips. Whenever yeah. you can give us a list of tips, Perfect. I want it. Okay, here's from Sarah. This is live. Sarah's right there looking at you. She says, hi, Dr. Oz. I'm a pretty healthy 25-year-old woman, but heart problems run in my family. My mom has hypertension. My maternal grandfather died of a heart attack at 55. What should I be doing now to keep my heart healthy long term? Sarah, you're not alone. Uh, half of the country will die from heart disease. And lest you, uh, you don't know this, uh, for the women viewers out there, there are more women than men that die of cardiovascular disease. So this is very much a woman's disease. Okay, family history. Uh, it is a very big predictor of illnesses in general, especially of the heart. But two-thirds of how well you will live after the age of 50 especially is driven by your lifestyle not your genes. So although your genes are important as something for you to focus on, you can overcome these obstacles usually. So let me give a couple examples. Hypertension, number one driver of aging in America. If you have a family history of it, it makes me worried. However, usually what causes hypertension in America is being overweight. So if your relatives who have hypertension are overweight, what it tells you is your genes don't protect you against being overweight. So you gotta do it yourself. Get rid of the weight and the blood pressure will usually melt away. Physical activity is the other big story here. If you give your heart uh, a, you know, an ability to pump and rev it every once in a while, it will stay healthier for longer. This is an interesting, very interesting question. It's a very special question, so sometimes I don't use uh, two, when they're too specific, but I think this could help a lot of people. This is about a person who uh, was overseas and uh, after their R&R, &R, they're having a hard time sleeping. Mm. Um, and they want to know, uh, I spent 14 consecutive months doing humanitarian work in a war zone. I left for R&R &R over four, five weeks ago. I'm having problems sleeping and being around large groups of people. Is there any advice you can give to help me make my transition easier? Now, we've got a lot of questions about sleep, about people who can only sleep two hours a night. Right. And so I thought this would be a good question for you to address. Well, let me just address her question for okay. a second. I, I think you have post-traumatic stress disorder, just from what I'm reading here. The fact that you spent 14 months doing humanitarian work, which can be very trying for a lot of people, and then you come back and you can't trouble relaxing. Uh, what happens in, in stressful situations is we become hypervigilant. And because we're hypervigilant, we can deal with that situation. But when we come back to the real world, it becomes very difficult to live your life in that context. So I, I do have concerns that you, that you need to deal with this more than just taking a sleeping pill or working on some sleep hygiene, which is what will m benefit most people. So that's just post-traumatic stress disorder. When you cannot sleep at night, it is a barometer that something is not right in your life. So pay attention to it. It's worth dealing with. Same for depression, by the way. Don't run off and get medicated for depression. It's a wake-up call to you. Something's got to be fixed that's more meaningful, more impactful than that. Okay, sleep for a second. Number one reason that people are not happy as they get older is linked to the fact that they're not sleeping well. 50%, half of all of us over the age of 50, I'm in that group now, uh, do not sleep well. But most of us who don't sleep well could sleep better if we had basic sleep hygiene. So what is sleep hygiene? Sleep hygiene is the following. Number one, you want to make sure that the room is dark which means you cannot be on the computer from the, you know, at the minute you're about to fall asleep. You gotta turn it off 15, 20 minutes ahead of time. I tell my kids bedtime stories. 
because I got to get the lights off to do that. I make up the stories in my mind. We talk about life. The stories have parables in them. They're, they're putting their defenses down a little bit so I can spend time talking to them. You're a good daddy. Yes, I'm trying, but You're you know, a good daddy. girls don't always think so. But, <laughs> but yeah, the, the, what ends up happening is I get tired as I tell the story. So for many of the, of the folks watching right now, use that as an example. Find some other way of doing it, but get the TV and the computer off for 10, 15 minutes. Allow the brain to see darkness. So the pineal gland, that big gland in the middle of the brain, will start secreting melatonin. That melatonin is vital for you to be able to sleep through the night. That's number one. Number two, you want a, a, a cool room. Hot is difficult. So you want cool sheets and you want the room to be 68 degrees or so. If you have trouble sleeping, drop it down to 65 degrees. That sounds cold. You might see your breath, but you will sleep much better. Number three, loose fitting clothing or no clothing at all. Both work well. You don't want to be restricted. You wear clothes when you go to sleep? Sometimes. Oh, that means no. <laughs> way, to, way to go, Phil. Um, and, and, and then finally, you want to make sure you deal with noise issues. So if, you, you know, if you've got a, a place that's relatively secluded, that's fantastic. Otherwise, think of a sleep machine. It's worth the investment. And last tip, that digital clock that you have that wakes you up in the morning that you hate, turn it away from you. you yes. You don't want that light. In fact, right. I tell people just get rid of digital clocks. Right. Buy old-fashioned clocks. They don't make noise and they don't have any light and it lets you sleep better. It's the first thing I do when I get to a hotel room. Isn't it? Pull that plug oh, out. Every time. I know. And anyway, it's always set for 5 a.m. for some guys. And it's people. blinking. Blinking. Five, five, five. Here's a question from Sheila. If I may, bioidentical hormone therapy pros and cons. I'm 47 and hot flashes are well hot. I may need something other than sticking my head in the freezer therapy. Thanks for the question, Sheila. Uh, hot flashes occur in, in, to a severe degree in a third of women, a uh, moderate amount in a third, and not at all in a third. So the question then becomes, why? Why do some women have no problems? Some of it has to do with saturated fat intake. The less of the inflammatory fats you eat, the less you, people seem to have these hot flashes. But assuming that you're having trouble with it, let me ask you a question about bioidentical hormones. I personally am supportive of them. I think they make sense. Uh, we've got lots of data to support bioidentical hormones as being safer than the old-fashioned hormones uh, that were used in the original trials that seem to cause heart attacks in women. But here are a couple of caveats. If you don't have lots of symptoms, don't take them. Why take a pill if you don't have to? So if you have severe symptoms, then I would break down, take the bioidentical hormones and regain your sanity. Number two, I would take an aspirin with them because the reason women were dying in those trials was from heart attacks. Thinning your blood might be beneficial. And number three, if you have not started off taking bioidentical hormones when you're going through menopause, do not start later on. That was one of the biggest risk groups. When 70-year-old women who had no real reason to take them started taking them, they didn't have any of the protective value of being younger, so they seemed to have more heart attacks than anybody else. Why would you take a hormone if you were going through your menopause? The, the reason that hormones were given originally wasn't for hot flashes. They were given because we believed that giving women hormones that they had when they were young would keep them young. Oh, I see. So it was given for the skin. It was given for oh, the reason hair. sexuality, mm -hmm. for their hair. Right. It was given to keep their bones strong. And you know what? If you had estrogen for a longer period of life, there's a possibility you'd have all those benefits. Right. But I'm just not convinced that there's enough strong data right now to advocate that everyone in America who's female go on bioidentical hormones. But if you're miserable in life because of hot flashes, that's a good enough reason. Yeah. But let's get it. Bioidentical hormones. We're not talking about the synthetic stuff. Right. Uh, you know, if you remember, Premarin was, you know, it was the you know, pregnant mare's urine. That's right. what the word stands for. Right. We don't want animal so sources. We want something that looks just like your hormone. Great. This is from Sheila. Dr. Oz, can you tell us about all the vaccines, H1N1, etc.? We're basically scared into getting. I read several rather disturbing reports after I got vaccinated, and what's worse, I let them give it to my eight-year-old daughter. I now hear that H5N1 is up next. Should we be worried? Should we say no to vaccines we know very little about? Thank you in advance. Sheila, thanks for the question. In my own family, Sheila, my wife and I feud over this. So if it was an easy answer, at least we would have resolved it in the Oz household. The fact that we haven't means you probably won't either. But let's go through some of the data. The reason I support the flu vaccine is that year in, year out, it will keep you off your back. Will you die from the flu vaccine? Probably not. <laughs> it seems to be pretty safe. Uh, will you die from not getting it? Probably not either. Although we do think that there are probably 20 to 30,000 people a year who do die uh, from the flu, not because just the flu and the pneumonia, et cetera, but also they have more risks of heart attacks because their immune system gets revved up. So they begin to get more clotty. Their blood sticks more readily, which is a normal response if you're infected. So I do think uh, that, uh, that it's worth getting the flu vaccine, uh, and I get it every year myself. I get it live on my show. Uh, you there, do? Yes, there are many different kinds of viruses, H1N1, H5N1. You don't have to remember all those. The fact is that the flu vaccines are designed to try to catch those viruses before they come to us. So we survey what's happening in Southeast Asia right now, because if they're having the illnesses in cold parts of the world right now, uh, they're more likely to have those same viruses circle back around to the globe when it hits the winter here. 
And viruses are more common in the winter because the virus particle lives longer in the cold weather and human beings are in more clustered together in the cold weather. We huddle together, so we pass the viruses more readily to each other. I cannot argue vehemently for kids to get the vaccine. Uh, my wife won't let me give my own kids the vaccine. Uh, and I understand her concern. You she's mean that, that, the flu vaccine? The flu vaccine. But they have the other vaccines. They have the other vaccines. Mm -hmm. uh, but she's, you know, reticent about those. We actually used a, a delayed uh, mechanism for administering vaccines, which mm -hmm. we, we wrote a book uh, called You, the Owner's Manual. Well, it's, it's, it's the Owner's Manual book for parents. Uh, and, and that book outlines in great detail our strategy. So we delayed the immunizations a little bit, not too much. And they all got the key ones they needed before they went to school, and they weren't in daycare, so it gave us a bit of an advantage. And I don't want people feeling guilty because they gave the vaccine or guilty because they didn't. But I want you to think it through carefully, and this is an area where it is worth going into your pediatrician who's thinking about this a lot and having the conversation, but please, rec please re recognize that you know, it's probably most of what the doctors do right now is talk about vaccines, and I think that these vaccines seem to be safe enough uh, that, that I will support them for my own family. Mm -hmm. Good. Now, we have a couple of questions about exercise and eating, and I, I, I would love your advice on this. This is from Deborah. What do you suggest? How long should I wait to exercise after eating? When you eat food, your intestines need more blood, so they suck the blood from your body. So nothing terrible is going to happen to you if you go exercise right afterwards. But it makes more physiologic sense to give your body about an hour to move the food through the stomach into the small intestine. So all that big rush of blood required to digest food doesn't have to focus on what's going on in your, in your gut. It can focus on what's going on in your muscles, which is why your mom used to always tell you not to go swimming right after you eat. Uh, but right. you know what, if I'm at the pool and the kids just had a watermelon and they want to jump in the pool, go jump in the, watermelon, in the pool with the watermelon, it won't be a big deal. But you should eat something before you work out, right? Because I'm oh sure. This, I thought this was, uh, I thought you, this is focused yeah. on what, uh, you, you yeah. should absolutely eat. It is imperative that you have uh, high quality food in your belly in order to optimally exercise. But I'll give you one little tip. If you exercise first thing in the morning, which I often do, you can do that before you eat. You'll burn off pr primarily fat rather than carbs because you don't have any food to burn off. So you have to go back to your fat stores. But right after you're done, you always want to eat a high protein, uh, healthy fat breakfast. Mm -hmm. That's very valuable because it'll keep you satiated all day long. And the more fiber you have in your diet, the less you will eat. I'll give you one, my one little big secret. Yes. Big secret for food. Here we go. Konjac fiber. K-O-N-J-A-C. It's like Kojak with, a, with an extra letter. Right. Uh, you can make sure taki doodles out of it. There are many sources. It's a root found in Southeast Asia, probably the most powerful powder for fiber that we know of. I love fiber in general, but I love the idea you can take a pill of this before every meal. It will fill you up and it will help satiate you earlier. If you're not going to do that, you can take it in powder form or eat the shirataki noodles, which you can put pasta sauce on. It'll taste like regular noodles, but there's zero calories in it and it will fill you up. And how soon before you eat do you take that pill? About 20 minutes before you eat, you take the pill so that by the time you sit down to eat, your stomach's already feeling a little bloated. I, I heard that you should drink two glasses of water before you eat. Same mechanism, yeah. like it a lot. And water in your stomach will also allow food to be digested more readily with the water, yeah. which slows down, believe it or not, how rapidly it goes through your intestines. The fastest moving food through your intestines is pure water. The second is, is pure solids. Soups move more slowly through the gut. <laughs> that's why it, keep it keeps you fuller for longer. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, and the other one is, what is the best thing to eat after exercising? Some have said protein, some say fiber. After exercise, without question, the most important thing, I think, is protein, if you've done mm -hmm. muscle building work. Mm -hmm. uh, but you want foods from each major category, with healthy proteins and healthy fats, that will put you in a safe place uh, emotionally and metabolically, hormonally as you recover from the exercise activity. You want to do exercise that's, that's going at full speed, where you're really pushing yourself a little bit and allow your body to rebuild by giving yourself the building blocks. Uh, here's another interesting one. Uh, if this is from Debbie. Is it true you can't lose weight if you don't sleep? Debbie, how wise you are to ask this I question. I have even heard of such a thing. If you do not sleep, yeah. The brain is going to be unhappy, and it has to be happy in order for it to function. There, the brain will craves four things primarily. It craves food, it craves water, it craves sex, and it craves sleep. Now, if you're not getting enough sex, you just figure that part out on your own, right? <laughs> but if you're not getting enough sleep, what will happen is the brain will crave something to fill that satiety center. So what does it go after? It goes after food. This is why people who do not sleep, shift workers, people who have chronic insomnia, are always craving carbohydrates because carbs give your brain that sense of satisfaction that, that sleep would have given it. So, and there are many other hormonal reasons why sleep drives thinness, but if you can sleep better, you will lose weight, I can almost guarantee you. It's not slothful to sleep eight hours a night. It is probably one of the wisest things you can do. And this is live from Deborah. We're almost out of time, but we have so many questions that I feel a little guilty not pushing some okay. through. This is live from Deborah. What's the best way to lose weight without all the fads and the stuff you see on TV? Deborah, the best way to lose weight without question is cut out simple sugars. 
Simple sugars come in many head fake forms, not just white sugar, but white pasta is sugar, uh, white flour is sugar, uh, all these white foods that you find normally uh, that don't have natural colors in them are pretty much made of simple carbohydrates, a lot of the soft drinks. So you want to cut all those sugars out and, and without those sugars, uh, you're not going to have the hormonal turmoil in your body that forces you to eat foods when you're not even hungry. Remember, moral, this is really important. The brain is not looking for calories. The brain is looking for nutrients. If you give the brain the right nutrients, it will stop asking for more food. But if you only give it carbs, no matter how many carbs you've eaten, it's going to want the nutrients that it craves, so it's going to force you to keep eating. So the brain's a pretty healthy organ. Brain's very healthy and yeah. very smart. And most yeah. of the brain is fat, which is why I always focus on omega-3 fats. And, and then give folks with that bit of advice. The omega-3 fats, which is what 60% of your brain is made from, allow your neurons to grow and, and respond to the world around you, which is why it's good for stress. Uh, it's good for general intelligence, for reduction of cognitive function, which is you know, forgetting where your keys are. It's also so important for kids and IQ that all infant formula in the country by law has to have DHA omega-3s. But here's the catch. Omega-3s come from fish oils, for example, but the fish don't make omega-3s. They eat omega-3s when, <laughs> when they eat algae. Wow. So you can get algae-based DHA omega-3. It's inexpensive, small capsules. They don't taste like fish. They don't have any toxins in them. It's biosustainable for the environment. It's a win-win for everybody, and it's inexpensive. Great. Um, this is an interesting question for a man over 60. Is it better to take, isn't it better to take liquid vitamins over the age of 60 for the body to absorb it quickly? David, I personally like liquid vitamins. Uh, I'm a big fan of them because I think they're easier to absorb for everybody. But it's not true to say that it's better for people who are older or younger. At any age, you can get liquid vitamins or powdered vitamins, mix them into foods that you're already eating. Uh, the, cap the tablets and the capsules are very efficient ways and inexpensive ways of getting these same products. Whichever your body desires is fine. Uh, in general, as you get older, I get more concerned about the amount of acid in the stomach and your ability to digest anything in life. So uh, the general concern applies to all foods you're eating, not just pills. And this is live from Erin. I'm 22. There's breast cancer in my family. Should I get screening now or is it too early? Erin, if you have family histories of, of breast cancer, you need to check for your BRCA gene, B-R-C-A. It's the cancer gene for women who have breast cancer. Uh, it is important to know if you have that gene. And if so, you do have to get screened much earlier. But if you don't have that gene, I would probably wait until 10 years younger than the, uh, uh, than the first person diagnosed in your family or youngest person to be diagnosed. Oh, that's good. So, for example, I had my colonoscopy at age 50. I found polyps. So my children need to be screened at age 40 to make sure they don't have precancerous polyps. Right. But they don't have to get screened at 22 as you are. And uh, here's another one from Lemon, Limos. Uh, I have strong reason to believe there's a connection between food allergies and depression. Are there any studies being done? Lemsif, there's lots of work being Lemsif. done. For, food allergies are a big problem, uh, increasingly uh, evident as we look at why people are unhappy in life. If I was depressed and had no energy and just was running on fumes all the time, the first thing I'd do is cut out the, uh, the, the glutens, the, the wheat-based products. Do that for a week, see if you feel any better. Maybe if it makes no difference, add it back in and cut out dairy. Try that for a week. If that doesn't work, then now you'll go see somebody to see if there's something else going on in your gut, especially if you wake up in the mornings and your eyes are swollen. One of the earliest tips that you have food allergies. Okay, I'm just going to scram in two more here. This is from Foley. I've been thinking about becoming a vegetarian again, but I don't like salad or beans. Last time I was veggie, I ate so much cheese and bread, I ended up gaining a lot of unwanted weight. Do you have any suggestions for prospective vegetarians like me who don't like meat or beans? Foley is not a vegetarian. Foley is a carbarian which means uh -huh. she only eats carbohydrates, which is why she's gaining weight. Uh -huh. So follow this is important. You're going to have some protein source that you like that you're going to have to find in life. There are whole grains like chia uh, that, 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 and there are many others as well that have proteins in them. Uh, so you can get the proteins mixed with the grains. I don't know why you don't like beans, but there are dozens of different types of beans that can be pr processed in so many different ways. Oh, I love beans. That I just don't understand how you could find all beans in palatable. If it's the gas that bothers you, there's something called Beano. That's a little liquid you can take right before you eat beans. If you soak the beans, you get less gas. You can get tofu beans that are made with in all different kinds of in different forms. You can even get things like seitan that have uh, protein that comes from uh, nine bean sources. But you're going to have to find a protein source you like. If you're vegetarian and you're eating only carbs, you will gain weight, which is really unfortunate. Uh, tanning, self-tanning, uh, there's a question in there somewhere from somebody who uh, wants to know if self-tanning causes cancer. There, there's been some conversation about that. Is that true? Uh, there's, there's folks who are concerned about the chemicals. If you, I like the bronzers that, fit, that are topical, that live on top of the skin. The chemicals that turn your skin brown by writing in them, you know, I just don't like the idea of 
doing that to yourself, uh -huh. of adding a lot of chemicals that you then now have to process and get rid of. We have enough chemicals in the world around us already. Plus, as I said a couple of times, I'd rather you get the real sun, right? because uh, it's probably the best way for you to get many other nutrients besides vitamin D. Okay, and the last question, I promise, I, I'm sorry, I'm so greedy for our guests because I know how much they love you. The last one is, how, how many years does one go through hot flashes? It's been 10 for me now. 10 years is a long time, yeah. but I have heard it go that long. Uh, most people have hot flashes for two to three years uh, and you know, differing amounts of severity. But can I say one thing about hormones in general? Mm -hmm. Part of the w way we cope with illness, uh, which is based on how our hormones are in sync, is thrown off by hot flashes. So it's not just a chemical reaction of the blood vessels suddenly dilating as estrogen surges into the body, which is what causes a hot flash. It's our inability to deal with the realities of what's going on in our life, which is one of the reasons I think that women have issues with hot flashes, and sometimes and other times not at all. Mm -hmm. And the progesterone levels of women drops as well as they go through menopause. Progesterone is like Valium for the female brain. So without that sedating hormone that allows you to deal with life, you now become hyper-responsive to a lot of things in your life. So use hot flashes as an excuse. I know it's easy for me to say as a guy, but use it as an excuse as to investigate whether there are other things you can do in your life to bring about a bit, bit more metabolic calm in your system. It may be a, a way of getting through those 10 years in this case of hot flashes. So what do men have in their brains to help them calm down? Because lately I haven't seen a lot of men be calm. Men, you know, if I men, pick up one more paper and see another bad guy, I'm going to be very upset. Men have all kinds of issues, as you know, <laughs> uh, and we don't have that calming hormone. So it makes us um, really ineffective in many ways of leading the family. It's one of the reasons that we need more female leaders because you are blessed with different phases of your life where you're able to, 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 to lead with that com emotional compassion that's element to what mm -hmm. you do. And people don't change what they do based on what they know. They change what they do based on what they feel. Right. And so too often we have guys who are browbeating everyone around them to get what they want done. Right. And as a doctor, I know this firsthand, but it's often the women who have the greater insights, which is why when you have problems, when you face mortality, which you do from the first day you have menstruation uh, and throughout your own life, we look to women for leadership on the health front. That's why on my show, I'm primarily talking to women. I have a lot of male viewers, but women are the chief family officers. They take the message, uh, they carry it to the next level, they understand how vitally important it is to, 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 the, to what's really going on in our lives to cope with these problems. Oh, I know. I'm, I, I've really had to, to, to lead my husband to, the, yeah. to vitamins. But, to vitamins, taking care of himself, get the colonoscopy. Well, he's a particularly challenging case. <laughs> he is. Well, we're out of time. And this was just so great. I love you with you. Oh, you're so wonderful. It's so great to have him here. And, of course, we're going to nag you to come again. And, but if you've missed any part of this episode or you want to watch it again, It'll be up on MarloThomas.com in just a few hours. And please tune in next week when we continue our health and self-improvement June month with Deepak Chopra. One last point. This yes. is really important. Uh, we created a site on DrOz.com where you can go and have your teens ask private questions that they're embarrassed to, to verbalize normally. Uh, it's a place that nurses moderate, uh, so we keep it very clean. Professionals answer the questions, especially if the, if the, if the kids have, the teens have emotional issues that are holding them back. Please get them engaged. Check it out. They'll What's it called? It. Well, they can go to DrOz.com, right. but, but we, really we have them go to Health core.org. Health core is my children's health foundation. For the last 10 years, we've been going all over the country teaching kids about their bodies. It's like the Peace Corps. Yes. But, you know, in fact, the, uh, some of the Shrivers are involved in the process. Oh, but, great. But the, uh, the Sarge Shriver started the Peace Corps. Same concept. Take college graduates, they're young and energetic and want to change the world, but you put them in schools around the country and they share their insights because they're only a couple years older than the high schoolers about how to live better, how to lose weight, uh, how to be more physically fit, but most importantly, how to have the mental resilience so you know how to control what's going on inside your body so you can control the world around you. And so healthcore.org uh, it has all, all this, this program in it, and it is very, very well received. So anyone who wants to have questions answered for their teens, uh, please take a look at the site. Great. And it's free. Good. It's free. You're the best. Thank you so much. See you next week.